All right, well, moving on to the next section in our book, we're going to be going over the uh, pulmonary um, uh, chapter. And uh, so chapter 21, I've divided it into two parts, pulmonary part one and part two. So what we hope to get done in both uh, part one and part two is explain the importance of the respiratory tract and the prevalence of pulmonary disease, how frequent and how common a problem are things like COPD. We're going to explain the basic role of the pulmonary diagnostic testing in medical care. Some things like uh, peak expiratory flow meters and uh, those things that are being used pre-hospital. Uh, we're going to identify the anatomy of the upper airway, describe the etiology, epidemiology, history, physical findings, develop a treatment plan for upper respiratory tract infections, epiglottitis, croup, bacterial tracheitis, uh, peritonsillar abscess, we're also going to describe the etiology, epidemiology, history, physical findings, develop a treatment plan for upper airway obstruction, trauma, tracheostomy. We're going to describe all those things as well uh, for disorders of the pleura and the mediastinum and the lung and the chest wall. Uh, we'll talk about chondrochondritis and pleurisy and pneumomediastinum as well as pneumothorax, pleural effusion, non-cardiac pulmonary edema, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. We'll identify the anatomy of the lower airway and describe the etiology, epidemiology, history, and physical findings and develop a treatment plan for asthma, bronchiolitis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, lung abscesses, pulmonary thromboembolisms or pulmonary emboli, hyperventilation syndrome, atelectasis, and tumors. We're also going to uh, describe the etiology, epidemiology, history, and physical findings and develop a treatment plan for pulmonary infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, and aspiration. Uh, we'll describe the etiology, epidemiology, history, and physical findings as well as develop a treatment plan for environmental occupational exposures to inhaled agents and irritants, gases, fumes, and vapors. So the purpose of the respiratory tract uh, is to exchange gas. Uh, for the body uh, to bring in oxygen and to eliminate uh, carbon dioxide. Um, it requires a patent airway. Uh, we know that uh, you know one of the immediate threats to life is an obstructed airway uh, that would um, impede our ability to get oxygen into our bloodstream as well as to eliminate uh, CO2. Um, and we're going to talk about the different diseases of the respiratory tract that certainly may uh, affect your body's uh, ability to exchange gases. Uh, we'll look at the upper airway first and then the lower airway. Um, indications that uh, perhaps a person is in respiratory distress include a mental status change. Uh, we know that the brain is um, highly susceptible to decreases in oxygen and uh, uh, has a very short ischemic sensitivity time range. We know from basic life support that you know, without oxygen, your brain starts to die within four to six minutes. And because the brain is such a, a, a big consumer of oxygen, at times uh, up to 60% of the oxygen that you take in, uh, when you lack oxygen, one of the earliest indicators is you know, agitation or um, irritability. Uh, and then some sort of mental status change. Um, other indicators of respiratory distress include dyspnea at rest, severe cyanosis. Now the presence of cyanosis would certainly uh, lead you to believe that the patient is hypoxic or has hypoxemia, not enough oxygen in their blood. Um, but the absence of it does not mean they're not hypoxic or suffering from hypoxemia. Take, for example, a person who is severely anemic. Um, you know, they can be severely uh, hypoxic with their anemia and not show signs of cyanosis. Absent or diminished breath sounds, uh, audible noises of any kind certainly is an indicator of an obstructed airway. Um, difficulty speaking in full sentences. You know, maybe they can only get out one or two word sentences. Uh, tachycardia. Uh, being pale and sweaty, uh, and the pale and sweaty comes primarily from 
the work of breathing. You know, when a when a person uh, has to work really hard to breathe, um, that that's exercise. That's a lot of uh, work and generates heat uh, and uh, causes the patient to sweat. And the paleness comes from um, you know the potential for some sort of uh, shock. Uh, looking for retractions and accessory muscle use. Retractions between the ribs as the intercostal muscles retract, as well as the accessory muscles of the um, shoulders and the neck uh, being used to breathe. Um, your approach to the patient who is uh, short of breath would be to you know, get a good history uh, to try to figure out what's causing the shortness of breath. Uh, you know, there's hundreds of things that could potentially cause shortness of breath, and our goal or our responsibility uh, when called to care for a patient is to uh, make certain that uh, they don't have a life-threatening uh, problem uh, that's causing their shortness of breath. And we're going to start with a chief complaint, uh, have them describe in their own words um, what's going on, uh, and then uh, when did it come on, and uh, what brought it on, as well as uh, if they are short of breath, have they been short of breath before? Uh, and if they have, uh, were they diagnosed with anything? Um, if they were treated for their shortness of breath, what sort of treatments did they receive, as well as a good medical history, uh, finding out their medications and their allergies. And we're going to get all of this, of course, uh, in sample, where we look at the signs and symptoms, uh, allergies, uh, medications, uh, pertinent past medical history, last oral intake, and then the events leading up to it. So we'll get a good history, and then we'll do uh, an assessment, a physical exam uh, of our patient who appears to be in respiratory distress, looking for signs of perhaps infection, uh, which would be fever. Uh, now, not all people who have infections have fevers, but if it is present, that might be a good uh, sign that their, their increased breathing could be related to a pneumonia or something like that. And if they're short of breath, find out if they're coughing, and if so, um, you know, what are they coughing up? Is it a, a productive cough or a non-productive cough? And if it is productive, what's the color of the sputum? We'll talk a little later about the different colors of sputum and what that might be telling you as well as taste. Uh, unfortunately, when um, uh, people frequently and chronically cough um, and bring sputum up, um, it has a particular taste. And when infection sets in, uh, the taste of that sputum will change. I know it sounds gross, but that's a reality. Uh, your physical exam would also uh, indicate, would also be looking at the patient and see what position uh, they're in. You know, certainly if they're tripoding uh, and working really hard to breathe, you know that their, um, their respiratory distress is severe. Uh, we talked about their mental status, uh, where some of the first signs we'll see in uh, respiratory failure uh, are restlessness, irritability, and confusion um, uh, because the brain is not getting an adequate oxygen supply. Uh, and the patient could be severely hypoxic, but now with the ability to measure end tidal CO2, uh, we can also see that uh, hypercarbia could be uh, a cause of this. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, mon mon monitoring end tidal CO2 is. Uh, uh, just as important, if not more important, than uh, monitoring uh, with pulse oximetry. Uh, we will see a, a breath by breath uh, change in uh, CO2 levels uh, where uh, uh, oxygen saturations, there's a bit of a lag uh, up to three minutes before we actually see a change in those levels. Uh, some indicators that a, a person is in respiratory compromise include uh, you know, their inability to complete a full sentence. They're just speaking one or two word sentences. They're working really hard to breathe. Um, they may purse their lips on exhalation. Pursing their lips um, narrows the airway and provides a little bit of positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP. So purse lip breathing is something that COPD patients are taught uh, to help them um, uh, stent their airways open so that they can exchange gas better. So they may be doing some purse lip breathing. Um, they may have uh, a very exaggerated chest wall movement, but minimal airflow, particularly when you're listening to their lungs. Um, they may be, uh, again, cyanotic, pale, and diaphoretic. Um, <coughs> initially, uh, when a person is short of breath, you're going to see tachycardia. Uh, 
which if the um, shortness of breath leads to severe hypoxia, then the heart rate begins to slow down. Uh, and that's imminent of cardiac arrest in somebody who is short of breath. Uh, blood pressure is typically unchanged in respiratory distress. It might go up a little bit in response to uh, just the excitement of not being able to breathe, uh, but it's relatively unchanged. Uh, you want to assess the respiratory rate. Is it fast, slow, uh, the quality? Uh, is it uh, shallow, deep, normal? Uh, and the patterns, you know, are you seeing a recognizable breathing pattern? like chain stokes where we see shallow breathing, deep breathing, shallow breathing, and periods of apnea. And that pattern just keeps repeating itself. Uh, those pattern type uh, breathing rates uh, indicate uh, things like stroke and head injury and um, where something like coos balls, really deep and rapid breathing, uh, could indicate uh, some form of metabolic acidosis. You want to look at the extremities, uh, the fingers, uh, if they've got clubbing of the, uh, the fingers, uh, that certainly is a, um, an indication of uh, long-term hypoxia. Uh, carpal pedal spasms, uh, if their fingers and, uh, spasm up and curl up tightly, and um, uh, that's usually a, a, an indicator of hyperventilation, uh, where perhaps because of anxiety or pain or something, uh, a person is hyperventilated to the point where they have carpal pedal spasms. Um, and then uh, venous engorgement or edema, here we're talking about jugular vein distension, uh, certainly pedal edema, that might uh, indicate some uh, heart failure. Um, as far as diagnostic testing, the standard is a pulse oximetry, and we'll talk in uh, more detail about that in lab, uh, about just what a pulse oximeter tells you. Um, you know, it, it it tells you that uh, the hemoglobin you have is saturated with a gas. And it doesn't tell you uh, how much hemoglobin you have, uh, nor does it tell you uh, what the gas is. Um, and um, it, it should be used uh, in conjunction with your patient assessment. Uh, you know, certainly if the patient is not short of breath and is pink, warm, and moist and can speak full sentences and uh, isn't using accessory muscles and their SATs are 88%, then you know that there's something wrong with your pulse oximeter. But we'll go into that in, in greater detail when we work with stuff like that in the lab. Um, the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve just is, uh, uh, it's the difference between what we measure on a pulse oximeter and what actually is happening happening at an arterial saturation level. Um, so when the uh, oxygen tension in the blood, in the arteries, reaches about 60, 70 millimeters of mercury, um, your hemoglobin saturation is about 100%. It's up in the high 90s. So, you know, increasing the oxygen tension is not going to saturate more of your hemoglobin. In fact, it's physiologically impossible to have a uh, oxygen saturation of 100% uh, because 3% of your uh, hemoglobin is dissolved in plasma. Um, uh, some other things that are being used out there certainly are peak flow meters. Uh, peak flow meters measure the maximum expiratory flow. Uh, it gives you a good indication of the lung's elasticity and the amount of air that the lung can hold, uh, as well as the bronchial resistance to airflow. Uh, you know, if the bronchioles are constricted, uh, there's going to be a greater resistance to airflow, and you're going to not be able to exhale uh, as much air as if your bronchioles were uh, dilated. Uh, and we measure peak uh, uh, expiratory flow rate uh, with a, a peak flow meter. Uh, what happens is um, we what happens is with a, uh, a peak expiratory uh, flow rate, uh, you'll have the uh, patient breathe into this device uh, three three times and take the highest flow rate um, and note that in liters per minute. And that'll give you a baseline. And then what you do following that is you 
give your therapy, whether it be a breathing treatment, uh, and then you measure that again. And uh, if your therapies are working, then um, you'll see an improvement in that liter per minute flow rate. If your therapies aren't working or staying the same, um, then you'll see either uh, the, rate the flow rate stay the same or decrease. Now, capnography, capnog capnography is a direct correlation to lung perfusion. And I want you to keep that in mind because it's a very important concept that uh, I'm sure we um, talked in, in great detail about in ACLS. Um, but it's a direct correlation to lung perfusion. Uh, it's also uh, used to confirm advanced airway placement. In fact, it is 100% specific and 100% sensitive for the placement of an advanced airway. Uh, it also determines the effectiveness of your chest compressions uh, because, you know, when you're doing perfect CPR, you're moving about 20 to 30% of normal blood flow, and um, you're not going to get normal blood flow to the lungs because you're just not moving that much blood with CPR. But you should get enough uh, blood flow to generate uh, end tidal CO2 levels greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and if you're not, then perhaps one of the reasons is uh, poor chest compressions. Uh, it also signals a return of spontaneous circulation in a patient in cardiac arrest if the end tidal CO2s shoot up to normal or higher, uh, which is what we would expect, higher. Then uh, we know they have pulses back and we can stop CPR and check for those pulses. Now, uh, when we look at a capnograph, um, uh, you know, capnometry refers to the number. Capnography refers to the graph. So when we look at a capnograph, uh, it's, um, there are four uh, phases. Uh, there's phase one, which is the beginning of exhalation when air from anatomical dead space is being exhaled. Um, that's your baseline. It should not come up because anatomic dead space does not have CO2 in it. Phase two is CO2 from the larger bronchial begin to pass the sensor and cause an expiratory upslope. So you're going to get a sharp increase in CO2 concentration passing by the uh, sensor, which causes a rapid uh, departure of the waveform from baseline. Um, and then it rapidly departs from uh, phase one, uh, the vertical line. And we'll demonstrate this in, in just a minute. Phase three is what's called the alveolar plateau. CO2-rich alveolar air is passing over the sensor. It's flat, it's straight, it's slightly angled up where, upward. And then phase zero is the end of the exhalation, um, the beginning of inhalation. So CO2 levels passing the sensor quickly drop to zero as you inhale returning the line uh, quickly uh, to the baseline. So here's a, an, an example of a, a capnogram. Um, uh, and what we see here is uh, phase one, that flat uh, respiratory baseline where there's no CO2 uh, passing by the sensor. And as we exhale, that rapid expiratory upstroke, which is phase two, uh, where you have uh, CO2 from the larger bronchioles passing by the sensor, and then phase three is the alveolar plateau, uh, and that's a gradual increase till we reach a maximum amount of CO2 that's being exhaled by the lungs, and that's where we measure end tidal CO2. That's where that number comes from, right at that uh, measured end tidal CO2 point. Uh, and then a rapid uh, inspiratory downstroke back to the baseline when we inhale. Um, so changes in any phase uh, can occur when the respiratory system is impaired. Um, remember the vertical axis is the amount of CO2 exhaled, the horizontal axis is the time and length of the exhalation, and um, the, the junction of phase two and three uh, should be a 90 degree angle. Um, when you have repetitive, consistent altera alterations in the waveform, uh, it doesn't look normal, um, then uh, that needs to be looked into. Uh, and it occurs breath by breath. Uh, so we'll, uh, again, uh, look more at these 
uh, waveforms and talk more about uh, capnography uh, in, uh, in the lab. Um, reasons that the end tidal CO2 would be increased, in other words, we're retaining CO2, could be that we're not breathing fast enough or that we've intubated just one bronchial, uh, allowing only one lung to eliminate CO2. Um, it could be partial airway obstruction, it could be rebreathing, it could be uh, uh, bronchial constriction as, as we see in asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Some metabolic reasons for an increase in end tidal CO2 could be fever, uh, could be recovery from sedation where the person is not taking very deep breaths, they're breathing shallow. Uh, could be sodium bicarbonate, um, sodium bicarbonate during the buffer process. When sodium bicarbonate is given to buffer acid, the byproduct is water and CO2. Uh, and uh, that really raises the CO2 level for the first 10 or 15 minutes after you give bicarb. Uh, tourniquet release, uh, any sort of impingement on extremity, whether it be a tourniquet that's been applied manually or the extremity has been pinched between something for a length of time, you know, more than an hour and a half or so, um, then you, you run the risk of um, all that uh, stale, uh, high CO2, high acidic blood uh, from that extremity washing out into the, uh, into the circulation on the lift. Uh, increased cardiac output uh, will increase CO2. Increase in blood pressure will increase CO2. Um, uh, things that occur in the operating room uh, that would um, not really pertain to us as paramedics uh, with some of their anesthesia systems may cause an increase in intact CO2. Some things that would decrease CO2. In other words, we're blowing off too much. Uh, that could be uh, hyperventilation. Um, that could also be apnea or total airway obstruction where we're not getting any air out of the lungs to go by the sensor to measure it. Um, so any sort of airway obstruction, whether it be total or partial. Um, if you extubate the patient, but the beauty of extubating the patient when it does occur, if you're monitoring both the number and the waveform, you'll immediately lose the waveform if you extubate them. So you'll know breath by breath you've done that, as well as your number will quickly go to zero. Uh, pulmonary edema, intrapulmonary shunts um, would all cause a decrease in CO2. Hypothermia causes a decrease in CO2. Sedation and sleep and cooling causes a decrease in CO2. And that all has to do with met metabolism. Uh, you know, when we get colder, when we're sedated, when we're sleeping, when we're uh, cold, um, those things decrease metabolism, so the CO2 production is decreased and the numbers will slightly go down. Reduced cardiac output, hypotension, hypovolemia, pulmonary embolism, cardiac arrest are all uh, circulatory reasons why our, our CO2 um, would, uh, would go down. If your circuit comes disconnected from the ventilator, uh, if you've got a leak around the ET tube, if your ventilator malfunctions, those could all for a decrease in CO2. So here's some uh, examples of some capnographs uh, where you see a sudden loss of waveform. Uh, if the patient is intubated, that tells you that the ET tube is disconnected, the ET tube is uh, dislodged, or uh, the ET tube or the circuit uh, has been kinked or obstructed, um, or uh, you've lost a pulse. Uh, decreasing uh, end tidal CO2, as you'll see there, uh, can be from an ET cuff leak, uh, ET tube in the hypopharynx, uh, or a partial obstruction. Um, uh, with CPR, you're gon not going to get normal end tidal CO2s, but you should be able to get waveforms through an advanced airway, whether it's a king or an endotracheal tube or a combi tube, uh, above 10. A sudden increase in end tidal CO2 indicates a return of spontaneous circulation. Uh, bronchospasm is uh, identified by the appearance of uh, what look like shark fins, and that's called a uh, loss of alveolar plateau. Um, and uh, when we see shark fins uh, on the uh, uh, way
waveforms, uh, that's an indication of bronchospasm. So it could be caused from asthma or COPD, uh, hypoventilation. We're going to see waveforms that uh, are extremely long. Uh, and uh, as we hypoventilate, uh, the level uh, becomes higher. So the, um, the uh, vertical axis begins to rise and the horizontal axis uh, begins to lengthen, uh, which would indicate hypoventilation. Where hyperventilation, you can see a whole bunch of little ones, uh, good waveforms, but uh, the numbers uh, get smaller the faster you breathe. Um, and then uh, a decrease in entitled CO2, as we mentioned, could be uh, caused by apnea, sedation, and a variety of other things, but that might be the waveform that you see. Um, so let's look at the upper airway, and we'll talk about the anatomy of the upper airway first. It begins with the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. Uh, the purpose of the nasopharynx and oropharynx, as well as the pharynx, certainly is to humidify, uh, clean the air, um, before it is, I mean, it's warmed and humidified um, and cleaned before it enters the lower respiratory tract. Um, mucus is secreted in the sinuses and the nasopharynx and the oropharynx that kind of uh, aid in the cleaning of the air as it uh, passes by those structures. And the um, narrowing um, of those structures as you go down into um, the uh, um, hypopharynx, uh, it causes a, a physiologic peep, uh, positive end expiratory pressure. Um, and uh, physiologic peep is somewhere around 3 to 5 millimeters of mercury. So here's just an example of those uh, structures that we talked about, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, um, the hypopharynx, uh, and how those structures um, clean, uh, humidify, and warm the air before uh, sending it down into the In assessing the upper airway, uh, it's important that we uh, ensure airway patency. Um, and uh, in, a, in a person who is unresponsive, lying flat on your back, we know the number one cause of airway obstruction is going to be the tongue, particularly in children, because of the size of their tongue. Um, <clears throat> but we want to make sure that their airway is open when we're assessing it. Uh, we also want to uh, look at the quality and frequency of respirations. That's more of a breathing assessment. Uh, as well as minute volume. That's more of a, a breathing assessment as well. Um, but once the airway is open and we know that it is patent, uh, then are they breathing? And if so, is it normal, fast, or slow? Um, is it deep? Is it shallow? Uh, and um, what are their lungs sound like as well as uh, are they moving enough air in a minute uh, to stay alive? Are they taking a good breath at a fast enough rate? to move enough air in a minute, and that's what minute volume is. Um, in assessing the oropharynx, you're going to look for obstructions. Uh, you want to look at the mucous membranes, the tongue, um, uh, check for uh, aspiration potential. Um, uh, we also want to uh, see if they're having any, um, um, if their work of breathing is increased, uh, and we can assess that by looking for things like Accessory muscle use. Uh, we can look at the uh, spaces above the clavicles. We can look at the spaces between the ribs. Uh, we can palpate the trachea for deviation, which, might, which you might see with the tension in the thorax. Um, some acute upper airway disorders include uh, URIs, uh, or upper respiratory infections, uh, URIs. Uh, and they include things like uh, sinusitis, pharyngitis, laryngitis, tonsillitis, it's all the itises, uh, and inflammation of the um, structures of the upper airway. And um, that inflammation can be viral, bacterial, um, you know, those sort of things. Um, some of the history that you're going to get when those uh, structures are inflamed, uh, they may have a headache, they may have nasal congestion, nasal draining, nasal inflammation, sore throat, cough, mucousy production, they may have fevers and chills and muscle aches, uh, and uh, once infected um, with this uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, uh, if it is a virus, uh, they should develop um, uh, immunities uh, 
to that particular virus. Uh, they should develop antibodies. But we know that every year, uh, you know, there are new viruses uh, causing these same uh, problems. Um, upper respiratory infection, the importance of knowing if that person has a URI uh, is that it may precede, or precede a real serious infection. Uh, in other words, it may start out as an upper respiratory tract infection uh, and uh, may end up in the head causing a meningitis or an encephalitis, may get into the sinuses causing a, a severe sinus infection, uh, may get down into the lungs causing a, uh, a pneumonia. Some therapeutic interventions for upper respiratory tract infection include uh, putting the patient in the position of comfort, uh, applying oxygen if, if the saturation is less than 94% and they're working hard to breathe. Uh, if we have the ability to monitor end tidal CO2 in a spontaneously breathing patient uh, without an advanced airway, uh, we should do that and, and see where those numbers are. Uh, that's going to give us a good idea of lung perfusion uh, as well as whether they're uh, breathing too fast or too slow. Uh, look for signs of all the respiratory distress that we talked about, it, things that would indicate that their work of breathing has increased. Now, IVO2 monitors, I say monitors because you know, I'm thinking about a heart monitor, I'm thinking about a pulse oximeter, I'm thinking about end tidal CO2, you know, if there's, a, if there's an altered mental status with this at all, certainly a blood glucose monitor, so don't forget all your diagnostic monitors we have available to us. Another upper airway disorder is epiglottitis. Now, epiglottitis is a potentially life-threatening infection of the supraglottic structures of the airway. Um, it includes an inflammation on the base of the tongue, uh, in the um, aripiglottic folds, uh, the arytenoids, the tonsils, and uh, uh, the epiglottic tissue. Uh, and, of course, the issue with this is that the swelling can be significant enough uh, to cause a, a complete airway obstruction. Uh, and those are just the, uh, the structures that we uh, just talked about. Uh, epiglottitis, um, uh, as you can see in this particular picture, uh, it, it would be very difficult to even identify um, the structures if you were trying to intubate this patient um, with this swollen uh, epiglottis. The epiglottis is a little leaf-shaped muscle that lays over the glottic opening when you swallow. And if that becomes extremely red and inflamed, uh, again, it may completely obstruct that opening so that you can't breathe at all. Um, uh, you're going to get a, a good history and, and do a, a good uh, physical assessment on somebody who might have epiglottitis, uh, find out whether or not they had an upper respiratory infre infection um, you know, that preceded this problem they're having now. Typically, they're going to have difficulty swallowing because it's very painful. And the epiglottis uh, uh, is um, uh, an important muscle, um, and the structures around that, uh, the muscles around that, are important uh, in the act of swallowing. So um, if they're inflamed, uh, it's going to be difficult to swallow. It's going to be very painful to swallow. Uh, they're going to have a sore throat. Um, they may have a muffled voiced tachycardia, which is also called a hot potato voice. Uh, it sounds like uh, they've got a mouthful of hot potatoes, and they're trying to talk with a mouthful of hot potatoes. And um, if you just do a YouTube uh, search for hot potato voice, uh, there are some really good videos uh, that illustrate that, uh, that, uh, that phenomenon. Uh, they may have uh, pain on palpation of their anterior neck. Uh, and uh, they, they prefer to be in the sniffing position, which maximizes their uh, airway opening. Um, in children, uh, it's going to be a sudden onset. Uh, they're going to have a high fever with it. Uh, the child's going to be anxious in the sniffing position, having trouble breathing. You may hear strider, which is an inspiratory noise, which indicates a narrowing of those upper airways. Uh, they may not be able to speak. Uh, they're drooling heavily because of the difficulty in swallowing as well as the, um, uh, the pain that occurs when you swallow. Therapeutic interventions, uh, provide some supplemental O2, might have to, and children do that with blow-by. Uh, don't want to get them really worked up, uh, getting them all uh, agitated and worked up, 
uh, you know, certainly could worsen the condition. Don't want to put anything in their mouth. Um, you know, doing so uh, could cause some soft tissue swelling, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, could completely obstruct the airway. Uh, rapid transport is appropriate. Uh, notify the hospital uh, immediately if you suspect epiglottitis. So, um, they can have anesthesia or uh, ready the equipment necessary for impending respiratory failure. Um, you know, they've often said that in this particular case, um, you know, if you're going to consider intubation, you have one shot. And uh, if you don't get it, you're going to have to do a, uh, a needle cricothrotomy uh, or if it's within your scope, a surgical cricothrotomy. Uh, croup. Croup is uh, often mistaken for epiglottitis. It's an upper airway infection as well, just below the glottis. And um, um, the tissue below the glottis uh, becomes uh, swollen and inflamed. Uh, as you can see here, um, uh, the swollen uh, glottic tissue. Uh, it's going to have a lot of the uh, similar symptoms. Uh, the child's going to be hoarse. Uh, they're going to have some insp inspiratory stridor. They're going to have difficulty swallowing. They may be drooling. Um, their fever isn't high grade. If they have a fever at all, it's just a low grade temp. Um, they'll have like a seal-like bark or cough for several days. Uh, so this is a gradual onset where epiglottitis is more a sudden or acute onset. Um, and croup mainly worsens in the evening. Uh, or real early morning hours, but, but primarily at night. Um, so, you know, if it's 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, this child is presenting with a high fever, a sudden onset of respiratory trouble, a uh, inspiratory stridor, um, you're thinking more epiglottitis. Uh, there's minor croup with minimal distress, normal mental status, well hydrated, stridor when they get agitated, intermittent cough, mild tachycardia, uh, mild tachypnea, uh, moderate croup, uh, you're going to be alert, but they're going to be irritable, they're going to have stridor, uh, classic seal-like barky cough, uh, they're going to have tachypneic and tachycardia and uh, be using some accessory muscles to help them breathe. And severe croup can lead to uh, respiratory failure. Uh, they are at risk of a, a complete obstruction with severe um, fatigue occurs as a result of an increase in work of breathing. Uh, breathing is a, 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 an active process that requires energy. And if you're working really hard to breathe and using those accessory muscles, at some point you're going to stop because you just are too fatigued uh, to keep doing that. Their mental status is going to be altered because of uh, the inability to oxygenate. Uh, they're going to be hypoxic and hypercarbic uh, with all the signs of severe respiratory distress and uh, again, inspiratory stridor. Therapeutic interventions for croup, you know, keep the patient calm, uh, in a uh, comfortable position, uh, humidified oxygen, monitor their pulse oximetry, keep their stats at least greater than 95%. Um, I've seen some stuff with this, uh, just using nebulized saline uh, in helping shrink some of the tissues and, and moisten some of the dehydrated um, areas, uh, and it, it, it seems to help decrease some of the swelling. Uh, epinephrine certainly is an option, or, um, uh, you know, some other sort of beta agonist that will um, uh, dilate the uh, airways. Um, uh, racemic epinephrine is more popular in children than, than straight up epi. Uh, transport them, uh, be ready uh, for respiratory failure should it occur. And, and it may not be from a complete airway obstruction as much as it would be from uh, fatigue, from increased work of breathing, uh, and the hypoxia associated with it. Uh, bacterial tracheitis is a bacterial infection of the trachea itself. Um, uh, patient's going to have fever and chills, have some inspiratory stridor, a barky, brassy cough, they'd be hoarse. Um, uh, depending on the severity, different degrees of shortness of breath, uh, but they won't be drooling because they don't have trouble swallowing or uh, any of that sort of thing. It's treated with antibiotics because it is bacterial. Um, so prior to getting to the hospital for antibiotics, we're going to support their, maintain their airway, establish an IV, give 
them something for their fever, transport them in the position of comfort, uh, supplemental oxygen if it's required, uh, you know, be prepared for, um, uh, you know, respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, and uh, because this is an inflammation of the trachea, uh, if you have to intubate somebody, it's going to take a, it's going to be a much smaller uh, tube than the normal, half to one whole size, smaller than what you normally would use. Peritonsular abscess. Uh, Peritonsular abscess is a bacterial infection on the back of the oral pharynx. Uh, if you've got your tonsils, uh, it's the tissue over the top of your tonsils. Uh, it's usually caused by streptococcus. Uh, and uh, the infection is rooted in the uh, adenoid tonsil tissue. Uh, the patient's going to have a fever, they're going to have uh, difficulty swallowing, a headache, feel sick, have neck pain, have that hot potato voice as well. Uh, if it's on both sides of the neck, you'll see unilateral swelling uh, in the back of the throat, or it may just be on one side of the neck. <coughs> Excuse me, for a peritonsular abscess, we're going to want to Keep the patient calm, comfortable, um, uh, whatever position is most comfortable for them. Give them supplemental oxygen based on the pulse oximetry and their work of breathing. Uh, if respiratory failure or arrest occurs, then uh, use a bag valve mask, uh, establish an IV. Um, I would hook up a heart monitor as well. Uh, and if they're feverish, uh, something for uh, uh, the fever. Foreign body airway obstruction. Uh, that's an upper airway blockage by a foreign object, and that can be a variety of things. And we're taught in um, in uh, in uh, basic life support how to relieve a foreign body airway obstruction. And as paramedics, we're going to add a couple other skill sets to that as well. Uh, some factors that you might make a person more susceptible to a foreign body uh, airway obstruction include seizures, uh, if they're intoxicated by alcohol or drugs, uh, if their mental status is decreased, if they've got chronic medical conditions, if they've had a stroke and they're not swallowing properly as a result of their stroke, uh, respiratory distress, feeding tubes, bowel stru uh, structures may make a uh, person uh, more prone to a foreign body airway obstruction. Uh, it's a sudden uh, onset. Um, they may cough severely to try to relieve the obstruction. Uh, they may be wheezing and they don't have any history of asthma. Uh, if they're unable to move any air at all, they're not going to be able to speak. Um, if a person all of a sudden has unexplained shortness of breath, that could be a foreign body airway obstruction. Um, you know, auscultate the lungs. You may have unilateral wheezing, ronchi, or crackles. They may be working really hard to breathe uh, with that obstruction or through that obstruction, especially if it's just partial. Uh, they may be drooling. They may be in a tripod position. A therapeutic uh, intervention is, uh, you know, certainly um, uh, ABCs, uh, supplemental oxygen. If their SATs are less than 94%, uh, giving them uh, oxygen by blow-by or mask, whatever they're going to be able to tolerate, uh, encourage them to cough forcefully to dislodge it. If that does not work, then abdominal and chest thrusts. And then as a paramedic, we can, with a laryngoscope, a blade, and handle, um, and some McGill forceps, we can uh, do a visual inspection of the hypopharynx uh, and perhaps see the obstruction, uh, in which case we could uh, immediately remove it with the McGill forceps. Uh, if we're unable to relieve a upper uh, foreign body airway obstruction, then we have to do a uh, cricothyrotomy. Um, trauma certainly can cause upper airway uh, obstruction or upper airway disorders. Uh, it could be penetrating trauma or blunt trauma to the neck, causing bleeding or swelling, uh, which could be life-threatening uh, because the swelling could obstruct the airway. Uh, Any time that we suspect trauma as uh, causing an upper airway uh, disorder, uh, we would expect uh, from the swelling to hear something like strider. So if you've got that patient that's been involved in a motor vehicle collision and uh, went down and under and slammed their throat into the steering wheel and they're talking to you and everything's fine but as you're taking them to the hospital you note that they're getting more hoarse and they're developing some inspiratory strider that's telling you that those airways are swelling um, so some history and, and physical findings uh, 
related to trauma and upper airway disorders include a motor vehicle collision where we have a blunt force <coughs> excuse me where we have a blunt force um, <coughs> the cricoid cartilage uh, is uh, positioned anteriorly uh, and the tracheal rings could be bruised uh, and swelling can occur there uh, causing edema uh, and again uh, if it's upper airway we're going to hear strider. Some therapeutic interventions for trauma include C-spine precautions, um, monitor their vital signs, particularly look for that change in voice and the increase in shortness of breath, the development of strider and accessory muscle use. Uh, if they are bleeding into their airway, uh, you know, certainly we don't want to lie them flat. In fact, the current trend of, uh, with severe maxillofacial trauma uh, is that if the patient can be sat up and lean forward, um, that is uh, the preferred position uh, when transporting them so that they can drain rather than have all that drain back into their throat. Now, if you can do uh, uh, suction and uh, keep their sats up with oxygenation, um, that would be good. Uh, if not, then you're going to have to consider endotracheal intubation. A tracheostomy is a uh, hole that's surgically placed in the trachea to support respiration. Uh, so somebody with severe obstructive sleep apnea, uh, somebody with uh, Pickwickian syndrome, which is uh, an obesity hypoventilation syndrome, a little different than sleep apnea, um, but it is a, a syndrome that uh, may lead to a, a permanent tracheostomy. Um, uh, upper airway obstructions uh, may lead to a tracheostomy. Cancers may lead to a tracheostomy. Uh, laryngeal cancer, throat cancer. Um, and they can do a tracheostomy and put somebody on a ventilator for you know several weeks. And it may not be a permanent thing. Uh, it may be just what they need to get them through the condition that they're in at this point. And when they, um, you know, when they get everything fixed, then they can uh, seal that back up. And there's just an example of, uh, you know, where the uh, tracheostomy hole is uh, placed uh, and then the trach tube uh, put into that hole and a pilot balloon inflated to help keep it in place. Drawbacks with uh, tracheostomies or any sort of uh, permanent uh, or temporary fixed airway adjuncts include the development of uh, potential lung infections as well as development of pneumonias. Um, if the patient has a tracheostomy and they're short of breath, you're going to have to give them additional oxygen uh, and you might even have to assist their breathing with a back mask connected directly to the tracheostomy hub. Uh, if the tracheostomy tube has come out, um, you know, uh, they make a tracheostomy mask that fits over the hole. Uh, if you don't have that uh, and you're comfortable with, with putting it back in, that's something that you could do. Uh, but uh, certainly the recommendation is if it comes out, um, you know, you may have to ventilate them through that hole. Uh, or if their upper airway is open uh, and isn't permanently closed, uh, you can cover the uh, hole uh, and uh, ventilate down <coughs> through the mouth. Now, you may get air escaping into the neck, causing some subcutaneous emphysema with that as well. But uh, You've got to find a way to ventilate them. You can um, more than likely just intubate the uh, stoma yourself uh, with a, an endotracheal tube. Uh, understand that uh, you know the insertion is not near as deep, um, uh, and you very easily could uh, intubate the right or left main stem if you put the ET tube in too too deep. Um, chest wall disorders uh, of the pleura, the mediastinum, and the chest wall is what we're going to talk about next. Uh, when we look at the chest wall, in addition to the ribs, we have multiple layers of skin, we have multiple layers of muscle, and uh, connective tissue uh, like um, um, ligaments, cartilage, tendons, that sort of stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the back, uh, we have back and front, we have uh, uh, a lot of different muscles, and uh, these muscles are used in um, uh, 
ventilation, breathing, uh, and uh, they're, they're large muscles. And they can be strained, and they can be bruised, and they can be hurt, uh, which is going to lead to pleurisy, as we'll talk about. Now, uh, we know that the, um, uh, the act of taking a, a breath in uh, occurs from a, a signal that's passed from the brain, from the respiratory center in the brain stem. Uh, when that uh, signal uh, reaches the uh, diaphragm and the intercostals, uh, the diaphragm flattens uh, and the intercostal muscles contract, uh, pulling the uh, chest up and out, uh, decreasing the pressure inside the chest, allowing air to rush in to equalize the pressure outside. Now the mediastinum is the area between the lungs and it contains the heart and the eight great vessels as well as the trachea and uh, the bronchi. Um, and it doesn't really have anything to do with respiration, uh, but it does allow the return of deoxygenated blood and the circulation of oxygenated blood through the heart. So there's an example of the mediastinum and where it's located. Uh, and remember within that mediastinum, uh, which is primarily on the left side, uh, is the heart, uh, the eight great vessels, the trachea uh, as well. Um, your body has uh, both uh, chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. Chemoreceptors uh, are sensitive to chemical changes in the blood. Baroreceptors are uh, sensitive to pressure changes in the blood. And these are located in the walls of the aorta, uh, they're located in the carotid bodies, um, they're located up in the brain as well, and they're constantly measuring the CO2 levels uh, within your blood. And when the CO2 level increases in your blood, uh, a message is sent to increase your rate and depth of breathing to blow off that CO2. Well, the uh, once the CO2 levels come back to normal, or uh, even if you blow off a little too much, uh, then that stimulation to breathe is slowed way down, and your respirations slow down as well. Um, we, dry, we breathe primarily on a, a CO2 drive. It is CO2 that determines uh, when we are going to take a breath and uh, how deep and how fast we breathe. That's all determined on the amount of CO2 in your blood. But patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, who retain carbon dioxide, uh, over time the respiratory center in the brain becomes narcissized um, and desensitized uh, to the levels of CO2 in the blood because they're chronically, chronically high. And in those situations, it's believed that COPD patients' uh, stimulus to take a breath is related to their oxygen level, not their carbon dioxide level in their blood, but the percentage of oxygen in their blood. When the percentage of oxygen goes down, uh, their respiratory rate should increase, uh, rate and depth should increase, and when their uh, uh, oxygen levels are at normal or higher than normal levels, uh, their uh, respiration should decrease. Um, and that's the fear of, you know, giving a person with COPD oxygen, is that if their oxygen levels get too high, that perhaps it may slow their breathing down too much um, and not allow them to eliminate their CO2. And uh, while in theory that certainly is a concern, uh, we should never withhold oxygen from a COPD patient uh, who is hypoxic and working hard to breathe uh, in the field. The 100% that we give them in the short periods of time that we have them uh, is not going to cause their uh, respirations to stop. Uh, if they should stop breathing, it's more uh, related to work of breathing and the fact that they've just fatigued and have run out of energy. Costochondritis is benign chest pain. It's pain in the chest related to an infl inflammation of the intercostal muscles. Uh, so there's going to be inflammation of the cartilage connecting the ribs to the sternum, uh, inflammation of the joints. Uh, it can be caused from an infection. It can be caused from a strain or a sprain. But the, the, the key finding with costochondritis is the pain gets much worse uh, when a person takes in a deep breath. And the pain could be anywhere uh, along the thoracic cage. 
and is, uh, and is often described as sharp. Uh, treatment for costochondritis includes uh, anti-inflammatories. Uh, if it hurts so much that they're not breathing adequately, their pulse oximetries could be low, uh, their entitled CO2 should, could be up. Uh, so we want to assess that to make sure that none of that's happening. Administer oxygen, encourage them to take deep breaths. Um, establish an IV, uh, hook up your monitors, uh, and if the pain is, is uh, severe, certainly give them something uh, for their pain, whether it be uh, morphine or fentanyl or uh, tortol or something like that. Pleurisy is painful rubbing of the pleural lining. Um, you know, you've got that visceral pleura that is stuck to your lungs, and you have your parietal pleura, which is stuck to your chest wall, and those two pleura are stuck together by a small amount of liquid. If that liquid should dry up uh, and those two linings rub against each other, uh, it can cause uh, painful breathing, uh, which is virtually what pleurisy means, painful breathing. Um, so when a person has pleurisy, their history is going to include uh, the pain gets worse when they take a breath, um, they're breathing shallow, they may feel sick to their stomach, they may be pale and sweaty, uh, they may breathe so slow and shallow that they do become hypoxic because uh, um, they may just not want to take a deep breath because of the pain. Um, you can listen to the lungs because in a dry spot where those two pleura are rubbing together uh, where the pain is, and the patient can often just point right to where the pain is. If you put your stethoscope over that and listen when you encourage them to take a deep breath, uh, you can hear a, a pleural rub. Sounds a lot like leather stretching. Sounds a lot like uh, when you step into a saddle, step up onto a saddle, that stretching of that leather. Uh, you can hear that with uh, pleural rubs. Uh, for pleurisy, uh, if, if oxygen is necessary, certainly give that to them based on their saturation. Monitor their capnography as well, because you know they've got to eliminate CO2 as well. Um, ECG monitoring, IV access. Uh, you also want to consider, perhaps, if it's really painful, some sort of analgesia uh, as well. Now, uh, pneumomediastinum is air in the mediastinal cavity, and uh, it can occur spontaneously, can occur as a result of chest trauma, can occur as a result of mechanical ventilation, a patient being on a ventilator. Uh, it can occur in, in diseases that cause the alveoli to rupture uh, and air leak out uh, of the lungs into that uh, mediastinal space. So things like asthma, emphysema, tumors of the chest um, can cause uh, air in the mediastinum. Uh, it's interesting that uh, marijuana use uh, is another cause of uh, pneumomediastinum, and that occurs from the violent uh, coughing uh, while um, uh, forcefully holding your breath. Um, <coughs> childbirth, uh, uh, alveoli rupture, uh, bacterial infections, all those things can cause air in the mediastinum. Um, now, a pneumomediastinum, uh, it, it's an indistinct chest pain. In other words, it's not descriptive like heart. It's not descriptive like um, uh, pleurisy, uh, not related to taking in a really deep breath, or if you push on the chest, it doesn't hurt worse. It's typically just described as a, a, um, a dull ache. Um, and then they may have some subcutaneous emphysema if it's uh, significant enough. Uh, and Hammond sign is a crunching heard over the heart. When you listen to the heart, um, it, it's a crunching that you hear that sounds much like, um, you know, uh, uh, Rice Krispies, you know, when you're eating Rice Krispies. Uh, and that's just the air moving uh, around the heart as it expands and contracts. Uh, treatment for that, uh, as far as pre-hospital goes, uh, oxygenate them, uh, ventilate them if necessary, IV access, monitors, uh, and rapid transport to the hospital. Uh, the lower airway includes the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. 
uh, and the lower airway is sterile. It's, a, it's a normally a sterile environment, and you wouldn't think of that as much as we breathe in, but um, we have protective mechanisms within our respiratory tract to, uh, you know, to keep that sterile. Um, mucus production, cilii, moving the mucus uh, out and up so that we can cough up uh, things so they don't end up in our lower airways. Uh, and we know that um, uh, once air gets uh, through our uh, trachea, through our bronchioles, through our left and right main stem bronchi, through our uh, terminal bronchioles, eventually air reaches the alveoli and uh, that's where the exchange of gas takes place. Uh, the lung is divided into um, two lobes on the left and three lobes on the right. The reason that there are only two lobes on the left is, of course, the mediastinum. Um, gas exchange occurs through a process known as diffusion, and we covered this in the respiratory section in the A and P. And diffusion is uh, air moving from, um, excuse me, gas moving uh, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration in an effort to equalize uh, the gas uh, in both compartments. So oxygen-rich uh, air in the alveoli moves into the pulmonary capillaries, while CO2-rich pulmonary capillaries moves into the alveoli, and then we just exhale that. So that's how the gas exchange takes place. Now it does this as, um, and it's capable of this because of the semi-permeable single-celled membrane that separates the alveoli from the capillary. If anything distance that single cell um, membrane, uh, like fluid in the alveoli, um, then gas exchange is not going to take place. Uh, pulmonary edema, gas exchange is not going to take place. Uh, so there are things that will impede the exchange of gas. Um, your assessment of the lower airway would include um, listening to lung sounds. Uh, and if you hear sounds, uh, are they continuous, heard throughout both inspiration and expiration, uh, or are they discontinuous? Uh, are we hearing them only on inspiration, like with Strider, or only on expiration, like with wheezing? You want to listen to both upper lobes, uh, you want to listen to the middle of the lung, and you want to listen to both lower lobes, and you want to listen both uh, on the outsides or the, um, uh, you want to listen to the back, the posterior portion of the lungs as well. So here are the lobes of the lungs uh, drawn out here in, the, in these pictures, so you can see where the left upper lobe is and the lower, uh, left, left lower lobe is, as well as the right upper lobe and the right middle lobe and the right lower lobe where they're located and where you'd have to put place your stethoscope in order to assess lung sounds and the bases of those lobes. Same thing on the side. There's the location of those lobes as well as on the back. Now some abnormal breath sounds that you might hear when listening to lung sounds. Strider is a harsh high-pitched inspiratory sound that occurs over the neck. Uh, <coughs> it's usually, as I mentioned, an inspiratory sound and it's the result of restricted movement of air through the upper airway. So it's telling you that the larynx and the trachea, or the upper airway, could be obstructed. Crackles is uh, also called rails. Uh, it's a wet lung sound. Uh, fluid in the smaller airways cause crackles. Um, uh, it can be heard with pneumonia. can be heard with pulmonary edema. Um, it can be... Um, uh, only on uh, inhalation is where you hear crackles because what happens with crackles is as I inhale um, then the alveoli uh, that are stuck together or collapsed like in the case of atelectasis uh, they snap open uh, or air or s small fluid um, <coughs> uh, moves around uh, causing those uh, crackly sounds. Uh, fine crackles are heard late in inspiration. Medium crackles can be heard midway through inspiration. And coarse crackles uh, are bubbly, louder noises heard midway through inspiration. Uh, the thing about crackles is uh, it's not mucus uh, and is not something that you can clear with a cough. 
bronchi, on the other hand, uh, is a rattling or rumbling. It's a continuous, uh, louder during exhalation, but it's a continuous sound that's heard on both inspiration and expiration. And it's an indication of fluid in the larger airways, not in the alveoli, but in the larger airways. And it can be cleared by coughing. Uh, it's seen with pneumonia. It's seen with uh, congestion from upper respiratory infections. It's seen in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Wheezing is a musical whistling sound. Uh, it's turbulent air movement through constricted bronchioles, uh, which causes that. Uh, it's a continuous sound, but it's primarily louder during exhalation. Uh, so it's heard more during exhalation. We like to think of wheezing uh, as, an, as an exhalation noise. Um, causes of wheezing include asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, toxic inhalation, bronchospasm, congestive heart failure, emphysema, which is COPD, croup, pneumothorax, pneumonia, anaphylaxis, foreign body airway obstruction or tumors, and pulmonary edema. Uh, a pneumothorax uh, occurs when you have a, a partial or full lung collapse. Uh, something uh, uh, breaks the bond between the visceral and parietal pleura, whether it be a bleb on the lung, uh, that ruptures, uh, breaking that um, adhesion between those two pleura, and the lung pulls away from the chest wall and collapses. Now a pneumothorax can be caused by trauma, can be caused by rib fractures, uh, can be spontaneous without any underlying lung disease at all. Uh, like in a, uh, a very tall, lengthy, uh, athletic person who runs a lot, uh, can have a, a spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, people with Marfan syndrome are thought to have a higher risk of spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, it can be spontaneous with lung disease, so a person who has uh, COPD and has that bleb, uh, and it, and it, um, uh, it, it uh, pops or ruptures, uh, pulling the... Uh, the two pleura apart. Um, it can occur from excessive mechanical ventilation uh, and uh, too high a tidal volumes. With a pneumothorax, a person's going to be short of breath, they're going to have chest pain, they're going to be tachycardic, hypoxic, uh, hyperpnea, uh, they're going to have a cough that's going to be dry, uh, they're going to be sweaty, uh, they can have an altered mental status if they're hypoxic, they can be cyanotic if they're hypoxic. Um, and you may palpate some subcutaneous emphysema. Um, interventions for uh, pneumothorax, uh, oxygenation, uh, you may have to ventilate them if you can't maintain SATs with uh, supplemental oxygen. IV access, hook up your monitors, pulse oximetry, capnometry, heart monitor. Uh, transport them in the position of uh, comfort and watch for signs of a developing tension pneumothorax. Because should the patient develop a tension pneumothorax, then uh, we know that we're, there's something we'll do for that. A pleural effusion, uh, that's where fluid collects in the pleural cavity. That fluid could be water, it could be protein, it could be white blood cells, it could be plasma or any components or a combination of any of those components. It's usually associated with cancers um, uh, and here in the x-ray you can see that um, the fluid uh, identified uh, uh, inside that dotted line um, is seen as white on the chest x-ray. Uh, well, that's going to certainly decrease the lung's ability on that side to participate in gas exchange. Uh, as I had mentioned, causes of pleural effusion uh, include congestive heart failure, bacterial pneumonia, cancers, pulmonary embolus, uh, advanced liver diseases, or where they get ascites, uh, pancreatitis, uh, particularly hemorrhagic pancreatitis, uh, vascular diseases, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, as far as your history and physical findings for pleural effusion, uh, they may have one of those underlying causes that we just talked about. Um, you're not going to be able to hear breath sounds in the lower parts of the lung because of all the fluid. You may hear a pleural friction rub. Um, you may have tactile fremitus and uh, <coughs> that's where you lie the ulnar aspects on the patient's back about where their shoulder blades are, and you have them repeat the word 99, 99, 
99. Uh, and you should feel vibrations along the ulnar aspects of your hand uh, when they say that. Um, uh, egophony is where you have them, you're listening to the lungs and you have them say, uh, you have them say E. And you have them repeat that, E, E, E. But what you hear is ah, ah. Ah, and that would indicate uh, a pleural effusion. Or bronchophony, uh, you're auscultating the chest wall, and um, you have them say 99, 99, 99, and you should hear it. You should hear 99. Uh, all those things, along with accessory muscle use, uh, could be an indication for a pleural effusion. What we're going to do for it, we're going to oxygenate them, assist their ventilations if it's necessary, IV O2 monitors, um, pulse oximetry, capnography, heart monitor, those sort of things. Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema occurs as fluid builds up in the alveoli in the absence of heart failure. Um, it occurs in conditions where there's a high permeability in the capillary beds. Fluid leaks from the interstitial space uh, and the alveoli. Uh, plasma proteins leave the capillary beds and increase oncotic pressure, uh, causing further fluid to escape into the alveoli. Uh, surfactant production decreases, the alveoli collapses, uh, and this widened interstitial space uh, where we now have fluid between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries uh, interferes with the gas exchange. Things that cause non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema include high altitudes. Uh, it's called HAPE, uh, high altitude pulmonary edema. Uh, pulmonary emboli, drownings, uh, acute glom glomerulonephritis, fluid overload, aspiration, inhalation injury, uh, neurogenic pulmonary edema, allergic reactions, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and then causes that are idiopathic or not understood. Your history for non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema certainly could be, um, uh, if we believe the patient has pulmonary edema, we have to distinguish it from heart failure because we treat them slightly different. Uh, if uh, the person has is in heart failure, uh, they're going to have jugular vein distension, they're going to have per, uh, peripheral edema, maybe pedal or sacral edema, uh, and uh, uh, indication of inadequate uh, cardiac output. Um, Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, there may be an initial insult that you're able to pinpoint that would cause the uh, development of the pulmonary edema, like an allergic reaction, like the development of shock lung, like the development of uh, them being at a high altitude. Uh, renal failure, fluid overload, uh, respiratory distress and failure all could cause the uh, pulmonary edema. Person with, people with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, they're going to be short of breath. They can't lie flat. They'll have orthopnea. Uh, they're going to have crackles, rails, and ronchi. Uh, they're going to be tachypneic, tachycardic. Uh, they're going to have the inability to get oxygen into their bloodstream. So they'll be, have hypoxemia, not enough oxygen in their blood. Uh, and we'll measure that with uh, pulse oximetry and note that they're hypoxic. Uh, they may be anxious as a result of not getting oxygen to their brain. Uh, oxygenate them, ventilate them, IV uh, access, uh, all the monitors, pulse oximetry, capnometry, and uh, ECG. Um, CPAP certainly is the uh, preferred treatment for pulmonary edema. Uh, the patient has to be conscious, has to be able to obey commands. Uh, and uh, can't have uh, a low blood pressure or, uh, you know, have uh, other things that would preclude them from CPAP. And uh, we'll discuss that you know, again in labs when we work more with CPAP. Uh, you want to uh, elevate the upper uh, torso so that it makes it easier for them to breathe. They may even want to dangle their feet off the cot, uh, sitting in a tripod position. Um, diuretics are questionable. Uh, particularly for non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but pulmonary edema in general. Um, we used to give a lot of diuretics in the field uh, for patients suffering pulmonary edema. Um, 
because it created a large amount of, uh, of urine in a really short period of time uh, and relieved some of the pulmonary congestion. Uh, however, uh, lately what we know about giving Lasix pre-hospital is uh, that when we um, uh, cause the body to make these large amounts of urine in a real short period of time, uh, we alter the um, electrolytes and uh, we don't know what their electrolyte status is pre-hospital. We don't know if they're already low on potassium and low on sodium and giving them Lasix could make them worse. Um, we don't know if they're dehydrated uh, pre-hospital. Uh, you know, we certainly can do an assessment and have an idea, but we don't know their hydration status and giving Lasix could m further make them uh, you know, even more dehydrated. And studies have shown that giving Lasix increases the um, uh, the likelihood of developing pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so uh, it's really come into question and is not something I would recommend. All right, uh, with that we finished part one. Uh, we'll continue with more diseases of the airway uh, in part two. And uh, until then, uh, uh, The second I'm trying to get this to work here. Uh, <clears throat> I will, uh, I'll be talking to you soon with uh, part two. If you have any questions, you, uh, you know how to get a hold of me, so uh, don't hesitate. Bye now.